Welcome in, everyone. Uh, I think we're going to get started. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me okay. Uh, it's not too big of a room. Um, I suspect people will continue to trickle in a little bit here at the beginning, so uh, thank you for your patience in dealing with that. Um, I'm Jason Zarneski. I'm the Curlin Distinguished Professor of Environmental Law at Pace Law School, uh, and it's my great pleasure to uh, serve as the moderator for this event uh, that we've entitled Who Owns the Waterfront, uh, in particular uh, New York City's uh, waterfront. Uh, before we begin, I thought I'd have some, some preliminary thank yous, and, and I thought I would sort of set up the event for this evening. Uh, so this is an event uh, sponsored by uh, Pace Law School and its environmental uh, law program, and so I have to thank and welcome my dean, uh, Dean David Yasky, for helping support this event. Uh, it's also sponsored by the Pace Academy for Applied Environmental Sciences, which is directed by Michelle Lance. So Michelle, thank you for helping set up this event. Uh, is, is, is Donna still in the room? She's out, probably still working. So Donna Kowal, if you see her, she has a name tag. This event could not have been uh, at all possible without her help and support. Uh, we would not have our name badges. We would not have this room. So if you see Donna, uh, thank her. Uh, please uh, extend thanks. Um, I'm pretty excited about this, this, this event, and I'm um, excited for a couple of reasons. The first is one of the great things about working at an academic institution is uh, we can be a forum uh, for public discourse, and we can bring uh, panelists from different uh, sectors of government, private entities, academia, to have conversations like this. And the second reason is, is I'm relatively new uh, to New York City. I just came here in July, and I learned what an exciting issue this is, <laughs> and how many people had very strong opinions on the, man, on the, on the matter, and uh, we're more than happy to call or send me an email about it uh, in light of this panel. So I hope it will lead uh, to, some, to some lively discussion. Uh, the format uh, for uh, this evening is, is this. Um, first, uh, Robert LaValva uh, will uh, spend about 10 minutes just showing some old slides for what the waterfront uh, historically looked like uh, here on this waterfront on the East River. Um, and then I will, uh, after that, moderate by just volleying some questions back and forth uh, to the panelists, talking about the history of the waterfront, public access and use, the public trust doctrine, historic preservation, and the future of development on the waterfront. After that, uh, we will leave time uh, for questions and answers from you, the audience. Um, but we will certainly end no later than 8.30 when at least a couple of our panelists have to leave for, believe it or not, other work engagements. Um, so, uh, let me introduce uh, the panel. Uh, to my immediate left is my colleague at, at Pace Law School, uh, Dan Estrin. He's the supervising attorney in the Environmental Litigation Clinic. Uh, Tom McKnight, who's the Executive Vice President and Co-Head of Planning, Development, and Transportation uh, Department at the New York City Economic Development Corporation. Uh, Robert LaValva, uh, the Founder and President of the New Amsterdam Market and Roland Lewis, the President and CEO of the Metropolitan Waterfront Alliance. Um, I will not give extended bios of them, and hope, what I hope in the answering of their questions, uh, they'll be able to talk about their, their work experience and their jobs and, and how they influence their views on these, on these matters. Uh, so before we start with the moderate panel, Robert, uh, would you be willing to come up and just share with us uh, some of, of, of these photos, and I think, um, you know, they, they, they raise interesting questions like, what was the waterfront used for? What should it be used for? Do these photos uh, indicate to us what they should be used for? Well, thank you very much for, the, uh, for inviting me to the panel. Can everyone hear me this way? Yeah. yeah. So um, Jason asked me to talk a little bit about the history of the waterfront in the city. Of course, there are about 520 miles of waterfront in New York, uh, as Roland has confirmed. So I couldn't possibly even begin to cover uh, that vast, uh, that vast uh, 
wealth that we have in terms of the waterfront. And I'm focusing instead on just a very small piece of the waterfront, which I've been paying attention to for the past 10 years or so in a very particular way. Uh, but this is a waterfront of, of Lord, the East River of Lower Manhattan, which is, as many people know, one of the quintessential experiences <coughs> in New York is to take a look at this waterfront. And here you have people in Brooklyn Heights promenade looking over at the waterfront. And uh, it's something that people have been doing ever since there has been a city here. And if you go uh, back in time, you'll see the same view of the waterfront in Lower Manhattan, seen from Brooklyn. Uh, this is in, I think, the 1930s, and this is in the mid-19th century, and here is in the, eight, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, this is in the in, uh, 1717 and the 18th century, and here is actually one of the earliest views of the same exact East River waterfront that was sketched by a traveling uh, Dutchman in uh, 1679. And uh, in my particular understanding of the waterfront, one of the interesting things is if you start looking at these images, certainly the people who drew them were aware of this, um, you see these curious structures that were on, uh, built on piles on the edge of the water. And what these were were market houses. And this is actually the very first public market house built in the city of New York at the foot of Broad Street in 1675. And, uh, here again in the, in the um, 18th century view, there was another uh, market house at, at uh, Quenty Slip, and here was one at Old Slip. Here's another one, and here again, uh, you see over and over again these little market houses kind of hidden in, in, the, in the jumble of the development along the waterfront, but there they were. And uh, the um, public markets and market houses are actually something that is kind of built into the DNA of the city itself. These uh, scribbles were actually the instructions that were given to Crenn Fredericks, an engineer, when, by the West India Company in 1625, when the city was first settled. And um, it essentially laid out the plan for what you must do to lay out a proper city. And, uh, and uh, among the instructions, they laid out the city in lots, and number six, the instruction was to, for a public market among the, the public school and the church and the square, there had to be a market because these were considered intrinsic in the public life of the city. And uh, through history, many of the public market and marketplaces were, and that's law number six, were usually in the center of the town. These are some ancient cities. I think this is uh, Tingad and, and this is Leptis Magna. And this is Florence, and again, you always have the town square in the middle that also served as a public market site. Uh, this is Delft, which is perhaps more uh, appropriate for a Dutch city like New Amsterdam. And, um, but in New York, the, where the public markets all emerge, and here's a, one of the most beautiful views of, of the city uh, from 1664, I think, when it was taken uh, away from the Dutch and it was uh, given to the Duke of York. And this was drawn to show him what he had come to possess. In New York, the, the markets emerged all along the riverfront, along the East River. Uh, it was known as the Strand, and that was the, the public space, the commons of the city. That's how it evolved, because that's where everything came in. All the goods came in along the waterfront, uh, whether uh, by ferry from Brooklyn or whether where the ships were landing from all over the world. That was the first port of the city, and where the markets all emerged. And that is what became, what uh, came to be known as the street of ships, the edge of the city. Of course, by then it was no longer uh, the original edge of the city. It was Pearl Street, by then it was landfilled out. And it was South Street, and that's what this view is from the late 19th century. And um, known as the street of ships because all these uh, fast parts of the ships would line South Street from uh, the Battery going all the way up to um, Corlier. So, and, uh, the street itself functioned as a street, but it was also a public space, a promenade, and a place where people transacted business. The ship, uh, Merc, the, the captains of the ships and the merchants of the city would often walk up and down the public street and conduct their affairs in, in the presence of, in the, in the full public. 
And um, the markets as well along the way were places of public gathering and they were particularly special places because it was among the few places in the city, and this was all throughout history as well, that everyone mingled. And you can see even in this, uh, in this great touching of Fulton Market, and this was the arrival of the melons from Savannah, and it was a big uh, uh, festive occasion, that you have uh, wealthy and poor and ragamuffins uh, with no shoes and black and white, and every, uh, everyone from the city would meet in the markets and mingle in the markets, and that was part of their importance, actually. They were not just places to buy food. And this is a view of the rear of Fulton Market, Fulton Fish Market on the East River, where you see as well the fish loggers uh, conducting business, pulling fish out of these floating carts that would float in the rear of the building. But it was a summer and, and uh, uh, boys from the neighborhood would come and just uh, uh, strip and go swimming. Uh, I guess the lawyers in here would not approve of this kind of <laughs> liability today. But that's how things were at the time. And, uh, and it shows, again, the markets really were public fora and public spaces. Uh, Fulton Fish Market in particular, this is a, a very simpl simplified drawing of, of the buildings of the market that were on the river that still stand today uh, in right uh, just a few blocks from here along the piers, Pier 17, Pier 15, 16. And those two red buildings are the part of the Fulton Fish Market. And they stand in company of ghosts from the past, but this area in particular, among the entire length of the river, was where most of the markets of the city were located over the centuries. And the reason is simple. There was a ferry that ran from Fulton, well, it's now called Fulton Ferry Landing in Brooklyn, that's still there, and it ran to Peck Slip. This is uh, from that uh, same engraving from 1717. You see the actual ferry itself. It's a Dutch type of vessel, and it's loaded with live cattle who would be taken over to the other side, to Puxlet, where there was a slaughterhouse, as well as other uh, marketplaces. And, uh, and here we have the actual buildings, the fish market buildings that are still there. This one in white is known today as the Tin Building. It's the original site of the Fulton Fish Market. And this one is known as the New Market Building, and it's just adjacent to the Tin Building. And this is, has been, for anyone who, who knows or has followed what the Amsterdam market has done over the years, we've been advocating to the city that this market building, which is really the last one of its kind built on the edge of the water, just like that one in 1675, uh, built on piles uh, with the front facing south and the back facing the river, be preserved as a market site. And here, in, in our efforts, we begin again to the markets in front of the building with the very first one in 2007, where we were actually under the awning of the building and brought people to that site. The, the fish market itself had been moved in 2005 to the Bronx. Um, our reasoning, in part, stems from a decision from 1968 when the entire East River waterfront was being demolished uh, under urban renewal, and uh, as all the streets below here, now you have um, all of the buildings along Water Street, all of the financial and banking and insurance buildings were going up. This uh, concern from the city is, and, and uh, grassroots activists and the people who eventually founded the Seaport Museum uh, uh, the concern was that this being the original urban fabric, the original port of the city, was vanishing, that we should preserve at least one piece of it and make it be a place where old buildings could, uh, new uses could be put into old buildings. And that was the area that was designated as a special urban renewal district where the mandate was preservation. But uh, it has certainly been uh, a challenge and a battle because the, for many reasons, even valid reasons, the city has thought that after the fish market was moved, that that could be a development site. And uh, what I'll conclude with that is simply that we're in good company, I suppose. Uh, the very first marketplace early in the Western world were in Greece, where so many uh, things originated. And the Agora was the marketplace of the city. And the Agora was, um, and this is the Athenian Agora, had uh, boundary stones. They're, they're known as the Heroi. 
And these are two that were excavated um, in the 1920s, I believe. And what they say in Greek, and it's funny how they say it uh, going backwards and forwards, but they say, I am the boundary of the Agora. And the reason that these stones were placed all along the edges of the, of the marketplace were, was that um, throughout history, public market sites have always been seen as sites that could be encroached on by private interests. And, uh, and so these boundary markers were put there to say, no, this is a public space, and you're not supposed to build uh, or encroach upon it with, with private buildings and private interests. So it's certainly a very long uh, battle to try to preserve these kinds of sites. And uh, that's, that's a brief talk about the intersection of markets and, and waterfront and that, that's certainly been engaging my attention over the past 10 years. So um, thank you very much for letting me present that. So I'll, 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 you know, with, with, that, with that sort of as a setup, I'll sort of start to volley some questions back and forth. I, mean, I think those pictures are interesting, right? They give you a historical look at, at the waterfront. But certainly Robert's take, Robert, I think your take is a, is a particular take. On, on what, uh, how the waterfront should be used, and obviously in your work you're very committed to, to the idea of public markets and, and civic space. So let me, let me then add, sort of volley the first question to, to Tom. So Tom, in your, in your work, right, there's, and maybe in answering this question we talk about a little bit about, it, but when we think about development on the waterfront, there are other interests besides uh, civic space and public markets. How, what are the things we need to think about as we, as we uh, think about developing the New York City waterfront and balancing all the different interests from all the different stakeholders in terms of that development? Well, I mean, I, I guess you, you hit on it, the key word, which I think is balance. Um, you know, the, the approach that we've certainly taken with our colleagues within the city is, um, Number one, that um, I, I, we don't think that there's a sort of a, a one-size-fits-all for, for the different parts of the city's 500 miles of waterfront. Um, but in addition to that, a balanced approach is necessary. So in, in terms of like the, the, the factors that influence that, uh, I think there's numerous. Um, you know, again, depending on the site, um, is really going to raise different issues, whether it's around industry, whether it's around access, uh, whether it's around development, um, that all those factors go into a comprehensive planning process that really guides the city's thinking and the public's thinking about um, development of individual waterfront sites. And just as a follow-up, are there any um as New York moves forward, you know, especially post Sandy, are there any particular challenges that you see in in, in developing the, the waterfront, perhaps in Lower Manhattan, with the with more people wanting to move into the city, uh, with concerns about climate change and things like that? Sure, sure. I think you know. I think Sandy was really a wake up call for the city, and you know we've. we've all, I, mean, I guess over the past decades have really recognized the waterfront as a great asset. I think Sandy um, uh, revealed that it's also a liability and that we needed to think differently about our waterfront sites, both as a place we still, I think, want to embrace the waterfront rather than turn from the waterfront, um, but we needed to think about resiliency, protecting the waterfront, and balancing that with continuing to want it to be a Source. I think an underlying issue here, um, and linking back to my first comment, is that the waterfront, there's a sort of, a, I think, a heightened issue um, when thinking about development on the waterfront as compared to inland. Um, and it's really a scale of cost um, and a scale of infrastructure um, issues that make thinking about the waterfront a, a more complex endeavor. And it's one that you know makes the sort of coming up with that right balanced approach um, particularly challenging. Where can you can you provide that range of public amenity, and public benefit, and still do it in a way that's going to be cost effective? So Roland wants to make my job easy and just follow up. 
So go, go ahead. And he said cost it. But I think we call this uh, session who owns the waterfront. I, I think an uh, ancillary question would be who pays for the waterfront, um, which begs a lot a, a more profound question about what the waterfront is. I like to think of the waterfront. I borrowed this from someone else, but now I own it. Uh, the waterfront, waterfront as a as a utility. Uh, we uh, have a utility for electricity. We pay Con Edison our bill every month, then it goes out. We know uh, to call Con Edison because we pay for it, and we want those lights back on. We take the subway. We pay for our fare. We know there's some taxes that supplement it. The subways don't work. We call Yellow MTA elected officials fix that subway. The waterfront's utility. We, we depend on it. To uh, protect us, we found Sandy was that that, that was a, a, a harsh lesson that that uh, we need that to protect us in Landers. We had no gas, uh, even if you live far away, weren't affected by the storm directly. We needed for uh, we we enjoy it for recreation, for uh, education, for transportation, for lots of things. It's a utility, but who controls that? Hundreds, thousands of people, park owners, uh, administrators, private developers, the city of New York, the state of New York, the federal government. It's are controlled by lots of different folks. And if we think about who pays for the upkeep, it is, it is expensive, how is it exactly right? This necessary utility is now paid for in lots of different ways. And if, we're, if it comes, just going right down to the point, maybe the, why we're trying to have this discussion, should there be a 40, 50 story building in the waterfront or blocks from here? And the, the reason why that is on the table is because it's there to pay for that waterfront. That pier, it needs to be uh, maintained. Whether it costs four million or 40, uh, 50 million or whatever the, the cost is. We're not asking Case University to pay for Spruce Street or Park Row to, to pay these streets. We do. We are asking a private developer to pay for the, the upkeep of that particular piece of waterfront. It's possible maybe because that's a, it's in a rich neighborhood. What happens in Soundview or Canarsia, places that don't can't build large so I would argue that it's a public good, it's a utility. We need to tax ourselves and, and pay for it for the good it gives and for the protection it gives. So let, let's then ask that question, so who owns the waterfront? So I grew up in Milwaukee uh, on Lake Michigan. And so where I grew up, uh, it would be illegal to develop east of, east of Pearl Street. Uh, under the legal doctrine called the Public Trust Doctrine, it would be held you know, in trust by the state for the, cit the citizens of that state. And different states have different rules. And I brought my colleague Dan here uh, to help me answer this question in New York, which I learned was very much more complicated than it was in my home state. Um, so, so, so Dan, who owns the waterfront? I wish I could answer that question <laughs> easily. Um, and, you know, the answers are different if you ask the question looking for a doctrinal answer and you ask the question looking for a more practical uh, answer that is informed by history, right? Because the reality is that, as in any big city, you know, the city is mixed use, right? It has to be, right? So there's industry, there's commercial use, there's recreation uses, there's, you know, people want to be able to cast a line and catch a fish for dinner, right? So there are so many different legitimate things to use the waterfront for. Uh, the, the doctrinal answer is that we all own the waterfront, or more, more technically, the state owns the waterfront on our, on our behalf. Uh, the waterfront is, at least from the high water mark out, is a public trust commons that is owned by the state uh, for all of us and is supposed to be pre preserved by the state for all of us. Uh, so. But when you think about the history, when you think about all these competing uses, you know, my focus and my work is, is generally on, well, let me just say this, that we've seen really positive developments in the city. I, I lived in the city uh, dating back to 93. I now live up in the suburbs. But I lived in the city for 15 years, and we've seen these very positive developments in terms of uh, access to the waterfront, which is the, the, uh, the, the uh, west side of the village. What we've seen happen down there over the past 15 or 20 years has been pretty remarkable. I'm aware of the project on, uh, I guess it's Midtown East, a uh, similar project to open it up to public access to allow people to recreate there. So there are a lot of really great things going on. But my focus is on, is primarily on, on what's happening in the future. What can we do? 
to influence projects going forward and to make sure that that public trust is respected, to make sure that any project proposed for the waterfront now uh, doesn't just sort of pay lip service to, to the public trust and to the need to give public access, but actually ensures it in a really significant way. Uh, so we're always very focused, uh, and so we have all of these historic uses we have uh, and, okay, and we have these projects like the one we're here discussing, which I have to confess I'm, I'm not very familiar with. Uh, but we're very focused on projects that would actually remove uh, public trust lands from, from the public trust for some other purpose, legitimate or not. And, uh, and that's sort of what I see as part of my job is trying to hold the line when someone comes in to take away what's already there uh, in the public trust. So, uh, and uh, particularly, so parkland, uh, waterfront parkland is a focus of ours. Uh, and typically, uh, where we see waterfront parkland that is open to the public, uh, it's often in underprivileged neighborhoods. So, uh, Soundview was mentioned, Canarsie was mentioned, uh, <coughs> Spring Creek, uh, New Lots, that area of East New York. Uh, there is, uh, it's, those are some of the few remaining places where there is open space that's available to be used by the public. And I'm very troubled by what I see as a trend, and it's understandable why it's happening. These are sort of the last remaining large plots of land in the city that aren't privately owned. And so whether it's some um, proposed private use, uh, building a stadium, uh, or some perhaps perfectly legitimate municipal use, like uh, a solid waste facility. Uh, you know, where are people gonna look when they wanna do a project like that? There isn't much space left, so all of a sudden they're looking at this coastal parkland, which is typically in underprivileged neighborhoods, and, and that's very, very concerning, because once that open space, once that public access is lost, it's very, very difficult, if not impossible, to get it back. So, so that's really, um, the, you know, a big part of the focus of my work. Uh, so the answer to the, to the question, I think, ultimately, is that we all own it, and we all need to stand up for our right in that property, because it is a property right. And, but I think we have to do that understanding that there are numerous needs and legitimate needs that need to be balanced, as has been noted. And uh, I think it can be done in a balanced way, but it has to be done very carefully and very thoughtfully. So, so, so Roland, we've been talking a little bit about different types of development, and I think, you know, Dan talked a little bit about open space or the lack of development, and, and Robert wants a particular type of development, right, a public market, though perhaps preserving old space. So, when you think of development and how we might improve waterfront development or, or allow for the absence of development, what do you think the biggest needs are for the, the, the waterfront in New York City? Well, I, I, I think um, it, it, it's changing. Like, like everything in our city, it, it changes and, and, and emerges. Um, uh, there are things you can see uh, uh, that are more and more uh, readily apparent, like uh, the, the uh, boom in uh, recreational boating, wind power boating, you see the kayakers and the rowers, and then more and more sailors out there. Uh, you see um, and, you know, uh, the reemergence of ferry traffic uh, on, on, on the waterways. Um, um, but you also see a lot of uh, vacant, you know, vacant water out there. We were, I was out on a compass earlier today, and there was the empty Hudson right behind us without much going on. Um, uh, there's things you can't see, maritime industry, that's still there, still very important to the city, the function of the city. We still, we're still a great port. Um, uh, that, that, that those, those things need to be respected and preserved. Um, uh, I, I think there's a, the, there, uh, what Dan was saying is it, 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 it's home. There's, there, there is always a danger of privatization of, of parts of the waterfront. There, one of those, uh, near Soundview, there's Ferry Point Park, which is a Donald Trump uh, golf course now. I like golf as much as the next guy, but that's a big, big hunk of. I don't like golf as much as the next guy, but I. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I maybe I'm getting older, maybe we will like golf. 
You don't have a decal. I don't think I do. But anyway, it's a large piece of waterfront that's being used for that. The conduization of the waterfront, uh, that's something we, we, we're very concerned about. And the city, to its credit, over the last, has, has adopted, um, I think, a progressive zoning uh, that called for um, uh, greater access uh, to the water, not greater access in the water. I think that's the next uh, step that we're all uh, looking for to create uh, reopen neighborhoods that I think were cut off from the water. So I think where where I'd like to see more is is docks, pier, wars, where historic ships, tall ships, uh, recreational boats can go. Uh, getting in, in getting New Yorkers reacquainted with the water that uh, surrounds them is I think the, the next most important thing that we have to work for. Thanks. I mean, I think it's really like, it's interesting like, the idea of a working waterfront and how a working waterfront would exist in a place like New York City. I mean, it exists in some places still, like Portland, Maine. Tom, I wonder if you might share with us, in your experience at, at EDC, when you think about the idea of a working waterfront and access, sort of what might be, oh, I don't know, exciting projects or controversial issues that you're coming across in terms of both public access to the waterfront and then and, and, uh, and commercial access to the waterfront as opposed to residential development and those types of things. Right. Well, I guess just a, a comment on the working waterfront. I think Roland's 100% right. I think we, um, you know, the, we, the, the era of great maritime commerce perhaps is behind us, but there is still a very significant maritime industry within the city of New York. It really is to a degree an invisible economy. Um, for instance, 90% of the, type, the tugboat fleets uh, working in the harbor are based in New York. Many of them are based on the North Shore of Staten Island. Which is kind of a very quiet treasure for maritime support. But um, to your second question, uh, I guess a, a project that we think about that uh, we've been working on that um, tries to strike that balance between uh, this desire for public access uh, and commerce and industry is in Sunset Park in Brooklyn. Uh, EDC operates an industrial facility called Bush Terminal part of a larger, uh, a much larger industrial facility um, run by Bush, Irving Bush. Um, in the early part of the 1900s, we still operate this industrial facility. Uh, I guess going back about um, 10 plus years, there was a, um, a planning process that resulted in a uh, proposal to develop a park along the waterfront. And um, we're now in the final stages of completing it. And what, um, what we've worked to do is to try to strike that balance between a strong desire in the Sunset Park community um, to get at their water, into their water, as Rollins says, with um, a really a competing need um, and a competing interest amongst, amongst industry to sort of have a controlled industrial environment um, by which to do business. And so right now it's still a work in progress. The park isn't yet open. It will be very soon. Um, and I think it, it's, a, it's really a test case for um, how you can bring together two uses that, on the face of it, may not be complementary, but there are, there are innovative ways you can manage it to make it open. So, so, so Dan, I'm, you know, I'm a lawyer like you. Help me, I'm following up on your sort of, your, your definite, your, your, answer to who owns the waterfront. Um, it struck, you pointed out like, well, maybe not private development, then you said, and not stadiums, right? And some people will consider stadiums as a, as a public uh, as a public resource. So if we own it, under your understanding of the law, what is, who is us? You know, and what, you know, the owners of residential buildings are us, who, who is us? And then uh, what I, after he answers that question, I, I'd like to hear from the rest of the panel about, as we think about who the public is, is that the people who live in the neighborhood? Is that all of New York City? Is that the tourists? Um, who is the public that should be deciding these issues? And who should, we, who should the, the waterfront accommodate? Well, the us, us is the public generally, right? But, but that, it doesn't mean that any use that's deemed to be a, a decent or good public use is automatically an okay use because what the public trust doctrine says 
is that that access, you know, whether you're talking about navigation on navigable waters, whether you're talking about the use of public spaces like a dock, for example, uh, whether you're talking about municipal parkland, that, that those types of, of properties that are owned by the state on our behalf need to be preserved for the, the uses at which, for which they were developed. So a dock needs that, that's, that's purchased or needed to a municipality, for example, to be used for, by the public for boating can't be leased to a, to a private company to be used for commercial for some commercial purpose. I mean, that, that's very clear in New York law. Uh, you know, so it's not, there are other uh, policies that come into, to, uh, that come into play when you're talking about uh, the coastal zone. So you start talking about coastal zone management under federal law, under state law, under municipal law. New York City has its own uh, uh, waterfront revitalization program, which I have here and you can find on the internet. Uh, and, and these types of programs cover, uh, they, they go landward much farther than the public trust doctrine covers in terms of waterways. Uh, and, and so when you get into what's appropriate, to, uh, what are appropriate things to do within the coastal zone uh, and what policies would be hindered or what policies would be helped uh, with respect to certain uses, those are appropriate questions to ask when you're going through CZMA type review. Um, but when you're talking about the public trust doctrine, you're talking so coastal about zone management. Act. Coast, I'm sorry, coastal zone management act, which is a federal law, um, and there is also uh, there are also New York State statutes and regulations uh, promulgated uh, pursuant to that federal law, and then uh, many uh, municipalities throughout the state have developed their own programs. Uh, that essentially set forth policies uh, consistent with federal and state law that the, that uh, those governmental entities consider when they're trying to decide whether a specific use within the coastal zone is an appropriate use of, of that land. Um, but but you have to uh, differentiate that from the <coughs> trust doctrine, which says the state shall hold those that those navigable waters. In trust, the state shall hold, uh, shall hold that parkland in trust to be used only as uh, navigable waters, uh, to be so that the fish are available to be caught by the public, so that people can recreate on parkland. And that's a, a wholly different question from the questions raised under Coastal Zone Management. So, as we think about use, who should we be thinking about in terms of the use, and for the you know, someone besides? The, I mean, is it? Is it the tourists who come to Battery Park? Is it the local, the local uh, citizens uh, who, who might want access to the waterfront? Who are the, who are the stakeholders that we should think about and develop it? Why not, uh, Roland and then and then and then Robert and then Tom. Well, the one way to uh, uh, think of the users, uh, think about the use itself. Uh, there's a term uh, that the state uses uh, at feds in the city: water-dependent use. There's a prejudice toward uh, water-dependent use. Uh, I think one of the great mistakes, with all due respect to my uh, friend EDC, that you probably would agree now, maybe uh, that, that the, the, uh, the the city made was uh, the conversion of a functioning and needed shipyard in Red Hook, in Brooklyn, called Todd Shipyard, into uh, a box store called IKEA. I do love IKEA as much as the next person. Um, but, uh, uh, you can put an IKEA box most anywhere in um, the, uh, lots of other places in the city. It didn't have to be on the waterfront. So thinking about uses that have to be on the waterfront, it gets a little gray. Is, is a uh, waterfront restaurant, that's a water dependent use if you're gonna have a waterfront restaurant, but does a restaurant have to be on the water? Does the park have to be on the water? Uh, you know, so it, it, I, I think it does, and it should be. So uh, uh, those those kind of uses, uh, and, and those are for uh, as many people will use it, and, it, and it's an emergent thing. As, again, 20 years ago, there weren't uh, as many kayakers and rowers and sailors as there are now. There are now. There's, a, there's emerging, and, and it's because of the Clean Water Act, it's because of a lot of good reasons, um, and those folks, those folks have to be on the water. And we need to, uh, I think, recognize the demand for that and create facilities for that. Um, you know, I think uh, tourism on the water, the wheel of the building, uh, it's not a more dependent use, but it's going to be an attraction. It's going to create jobs and activity and, and traffic on the water. 
I went to London, I, I rode on the wheel, a uh, Ferris wheel on the Thames River. And it's me and tens of thousands of other people down there enjoying the Thames because of that wheel. So there, it, it, there is some gray in there, but we should, we should always veer toward those water dependent uses, especially for maritime industry, for piers, for uh, marinas, um, for markets. Uh, so that's where I, where I was going to go. Robert? Well, it's, it's certainly a complicated issue because even in many of the images I showed, the waterfront that seems so interesting and vibrant and vital in those, in those historic images is maybe something that people today would not actually want to see. There's a lot of industry on the waterfront, there was a lot of traffic and commerce, and... Uh, a lot of the New York City sanitation used to be done sure. on the waterfront. So, and, and in that regard, it's, it's... And yet that greatly benefited the city because it made New York into the into the metropolis that it is today. So, and so who is to say that that's not also a valid public use of the waterfront? But I guess in thinking about the waterfront today and how it... Um, Given that that's all gone and now it's facing a new future, and now we have certain also concerns about the uh, post Sandy uh, reality. But I guess in thinking about the public, to me it would seem that, especially in a great city like New York with so much waterfront, that the local communities all along that waterfront should have a strong and powerful voice in, in understanding and determining how it evolves because. After all, they they understand that that's the best of the people who are there, and I think it's just a, it's that's a voice that, that ought to be heard more. Tom, what about your yeah, view of different think, stakeholders and how we balance that? I, I think I would I would agree with Robert's comments. I I think I, I think the process um, within the city when we're thinking about sites works that way. I think that there's. I, mean, I guess an overarching response to your question is I think the answer is yes. I think you know there's room there's room in the public sphere for each of us, whether it's tourists or residents or community, local community. I think the um, the city's planning processes around areas and sites tends does tend to skew towards the local community. Um, I think the, you know for plans around you know, thinking about development plans we did for. Hunters Point South and the Long Island City waterfront, the Stapleton waterfront in Staten Island, where that was really the result of a, a really consensus-driven, locally-based process. I think you have to be conscious and aware as a responsible planner to be thinking about the public at large, whether tourist or other visitor or for industry. Um, but I think the community voice, I think the, the the, the evidence is clear in, in pl past planning processes that the community has had a very, very strong voice in those processes. And I think when you see the fruit of those plans, it's, it's really clear that, um, that when you see those waterfront parks, when you see that, that waterfront access and transportation and other amenities, that's really reflective of a, of a community-driven process. Do you have a follow-up? Dan do. and Roland both have a follow-up. So. Uh, so I think I think that all sounds good, and I think it's uh, and it, it seems like a reasonable approach. The problem with it, I think, if it's taken too far, is that you wind up with the communities that are least able that have the that sort of the, the least voice, right? The the least ability to organize, the the fewest resources to uh, to retain a good lawyer, for example that wind up getting the short end of the stick. And that's, uh, I think, a, a real problem that we've seen play out uh, in, in certain neighborhoods in the city. And so th th that's my only concern about that approach, is that I think, <coughs> and I think the city may have the best of intentions, but if it needs to build a, a solid waste facility, it needs to build one. So the question becomes, where are we going to put it? And then it becomes, you know, sort of, what's the path of least resistance? Because we could do this in two years, or we could do it in 10. Uh, so, so that's my only caution to the sort of community-based approach is that it, it can uh, lead to, uh, you know, significant environmental justice issues. Roland? Yeah, but actually, dovetails nicely with that. Um, that's negative. I couldn't agree more that uh, uh, greater awareness and organizing in those in, in, in communities like that is, is necessary to avoid uh, uh, or 
make some more fair judgments about where to cite things that are unappealing. But we just had a, a meeting last night in uh, Stapleton and Staten Island. We had another one in, in uh, the South Bronx, up in the South Beer, uh, up before. And there's there's an educational component of this. That we were we talked about before. We put garbage. We we put industry. We put things. We put people. Most of that all all that public housing is on. Anything we didn't want to see was out there on the on the water's edge. Um, uh, we uh, uh, have to now now that there's possibilities of transportation, education, and, and economic development and recreation. Uh, educate all New Yorkers. So as we're we paying, so these meetings in these neighborhoods, we're basically bringing maritime users, uh, ferry operators, historic boat owners, uh, uh, paddlers uh, to these communities saying, here are some things you might consider in your neighborhood. What, what are your ideas in the neighborhood? And mining, so like, just like I live uh, in Flatbush, people do not think about the waterfront in my, in my community. Well, there's many of my island people from the, from the Caribbean, but they don't think about their, their, their new city as, as a waterfront community. So educating these uh, uh, community boards and, and uh, local officials and, and local residents about what the possibilities and listening to them too about their aspirations for the waterfront, I think is a key component in how we uh, define use and, and, and reactivate these, uh, these assets. So talk a little bit about you know, who the public is, right? how we should incorporate the, the views of these stakeholders. Let me ask this next question of Robert, because I think, I think Robert has a particular view of, of what perhaps the waterfront should look like. So my kids, their favorite part is the steps, the tidal steps down by the, by the Ikea ferry. We can talk about the ferries in a little while, where when the, tide, this, the tide comes in, you, you know, they can, they, they feel the ocean. And so when you, when you, you know, and you showed the, the kids bathing, when you think about your vision, your particular vision for the waterfront, what, what is that vision? Well, I don't think I could apply <clears throat> that vision to the entire waterfront because it's so specific to one particular site. And the reason that I promoted that vision for that one particular site is because of the uniqueness of that site. So in some ways, it's, it's very bound to that particular place, which I per personally see as, as a resource, as an asset that despite the problems that it does have in terms of infrastructure and in terms of maintenance and cost is so irreplaceable that it's something that we ought to try and preserve simply because it tells a story, that story that I just went through, uh, which no one would expect it that, that it should stay still. Certainly the city keeps evolved and keeps evolving and will continue to evolve and grow, but if there's a one small part of it that can tell that story of what it once was without having, and it's not something you can fake. You can't, you wouldn't want to make such a place as a Disney-fied version of, this is you know the old New York. But because we have that place that is left, uh, it's been important to me to, to at least uh, put out the voice that we should keep it and, and try to use it as it once was used. So that's a very specific thing that I wouldn't apply to the rest of those 520 miles. <laughs> It's a great <coughs> so, so, Tom, uh, Roland doesn't like IKEA, but a lot of people like the IKEA ferry because it's the best way to get to Red Hook for Manhattan. So, um, and I was reading in a couple of the newspapers the other day about the idea of of really expanding the ferry service and connecting um, the the ferry service to the, the greater transportation area in New York City. So, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about. Uh, is that a possibility? What needs to happen so we can use the waterfront and the actual water as, as a means of transportation, uh, which I think could potentially be a real asset to the city? Sure. Yeah, the ferries have been something that we see in the city have been very invested in. Um, East River Ferry has proven to be a real success. It's, it's a pilot, um, and it really was established to sort of test the viability of um, local ferry service. It's, it's proven to be quite effective. We've done a lot of work around thinking about growing the system. At, you know, what are the most viable routes? What are the challenges? What are the opportunities? And um, you know, I, I think the vision of a citywide system is um, is a great one. I think the, the the challenges are at the end of the day practical ones. Uh, you know, the, the 
reality is is that part of what has made East River Ferry so successful is that it's in a very high density area and a fairly limited geography. And the farther you reach out, um, the more costly it gets to operate, the, the lower your ridership becomes. Um, so we've done a lot of work. It's actually a preliminary study that we released at the end of the end of the year, looking at uh, potential routes that um, we believe are more viable than others. Um, and we're hopeful that over time, um, once the funding, a more sustainable funding source can be identified, that the system can continue to grow. But I think that, uh, uh, just taking it back to the waterfront, there's a transportation benefit along the lines of what Roland said, and really not bringing only people to the water's edge, but actually out onto the water. Uh, but I think it's had a double effect of, um, giving another reason to bring people to the waterfront. Uh, that they're not really only thinking about getting from one place to another, um, but it's really giving them a chance to really engage with, appreciate, and return to the waterfront. So in the same way that you know, Brooklyn Bridge Park or other waterfront amenities have really allowed for New Yorkers to sort of uh, to reconnect with their waterfront, I think the ferries have as well. And, you know, if you haven't ridden on the the East River Ferry, or one of the other ferries that serve New York, it's a very special, a very special experience to be uh, to be commuting. So we have about five minutes left before I want to open it to, to Q and A, and I'm, and I'm sure the audience will ask far more controversial questions than me. Um, and what I'd like each of you to answer, if you could each, if you could each wave your magic Harry Potter, or it should really be called Hermione Granger wand, because that's what the book's really about. But I have two daughters. Uh, and, and what would what what would you do to uh, improve uh, the New York City waterfront? What, what's the one thing? We'll start with we'll start with Dan, and we'll move we'll move down the line. I'm going to give you two things. <clears throat> one would be to religiously preserve all existing public access. Protect it in, without any exceptions. Um, you know, whether they're municipal, you propose municipal uses, commercial uses, industrial uses. If you've got open space on the waterfront right now, it needs to remain open space. And the other thing, I, and that's with respect to existing open space and waterfront. With respect to future development on the waterfront, I would, my magic wand would be that government uh, require developers to uh, provide for real public access. I'm not talking about even just views, but perhaps a way to put a boat in the water um, uh, as a condition of being allowed to develop. The same way the city is requiring uh, you know, a certain amount of, of new housing to be residential, anything on the waterfront should, should, um, should require public access. Tom? I'll, I'll go for industry. I'll say that, uh, <laughs> that uh, I, I think if, um, if, if, the, if the, the market fundamentals were um, in a place where there could be greater maritime industry um, within the city of New York, um, I think it would be um, you know, perhaps not uni universally received, as Robert was saying, but um, it would really reactivate the harbor the city's relationship with its water would also be a powerful um, economic generator and an environmental benefit uh, by taking the vehicles off the road. Robert? Well, I would really consider, reconsider the zoning along the waterfront and in terms of the experience of the water and, the, and going to the city's edge. And I love New York as a city of very tall buildings, but I think that I would not allow, I would really limit the height of buildings, not along the water's edge, because it does, it does diminish the experience of the waterfront itself, and it does begin to create a wall along the water. And if you look at uh, cities like Vancouver, or places like that that have allowed tall buildings all along the edge, it, it definitely takes away from that experience, and that's, I think we should consider more that, that total experience. And as well, I think we should, I like the idea of there being more industry and more uh, working things all along the waterfront because I think that adds a certain kind of liveliness to it. Roland? 
Now, this is actually a hard question for you, but it's uh, too much. It's going to be one idea is, is uh, I thought about the late great uh, uh, John Crevy. And those of you who don't know John Crevy, he went into Pier 66 Maritime, the frying pan up there on the, on the, on the west side of 26 Street. It's a great fun bar. Passed away a while ago. And I, went, I had a conversation with him. And I said, you know, so the same question is, what, what do you, what, how do you, how do you, because he was tortured by trying to create this amazing, fun, fairly burly uh, bar and maritime uh, uh, asset. And he said, get government to create the tableau, but allow room for people like me, Mr. Pevy, or people like Mr. Lavava, entrepreneurs, uh, the boat houses that have come up. The, Allow room for these people to flourish. The, the spirit of New York to come uh, flower through on its on its waterfront. I'm full disclosure. I'm on the board of the New Hampshire Market. One of the reasons I'm on that board is because I, I I saw Granville Island out in Vancouver, and, uh, Pike Place uh, Market out in Seattle. These very organic, amazing markets and places that uh, are destinations that do well and do good. They, 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 they're, they're crazy, wonderful, vibrant places. I, I, I dream that the, the South Sea Seaport would be like that. The short answer is <laughs> your good question is fiber ferry service, maritime industry, and access everywhere. More access to the water. That would be the three things I would look for. And that magic formula that, that creates things like the New Amsterdam market and other, other places like that throughout the fiber. Thank you. Thank you. And because and, and I'm the moderator, I can answer that question too. For me, I'm excited about I like the idea of transportation. I mean, the idea of walking out to the water and getting anywhere you need to go in Manhattan, I just think it would be. A it's, it's a beautiful and, and efficient way to, to, to not to travel around the city. And I think of a lot of the Asian cities like Singapore and Bangkok where that's, that's common. Um, it, it, it would add a vibrancy, I think, for the local residents and, and tourists alike. So uh, thank you very much. And now we can open up to uh, in the, in the, in the Q&A. Uh, what I'd ask you to do is stand. Uh, speak up. If you're affiliated with an organization, please share that. With, introduce yourself. If you're affiliated with an organization or you're a, re, you know, a local resident, feel free to share that with us. Um, so, questions? Uh, I have to... Dick Hunt, John of the Hayes Law School. I wonder if this <coughs> conversation isn't really totally irrelevant. Uh, yeah. Because... <laughs> I, within a period of maybe 30, 40 years, this whole waterfront is, uh, all the structures, the parks, and everything else going to be underwater. Uh, and uh, the Empire State Building will be a waterfront property. <laughs> so, what plans are being made, and what do you plans do you think should be made to uh, deal with? The onslaught of that sea level rise and that increased storms. So. Who wants to feel that one first? I can start it off. All right, Tom. So um, I think, as most people know, the as a result of Sandy, um, there was a there, there was a very <coughs> significant blueprint uh, developed over last year uh, that really <coughs> focused on uh, what happened during Sandy. How can we prevent it happening in the future? What are the measures that we need to undertake um, to avoid a, a doomsday scenario like you're laying out? So I think it's really a range of things that need to happen within vulnerable communities like Manhattan. Um, one of the ideas that was put forward um, was a barrier system, a, a U kind of shaped system protecting lower Manhattan. But the reality is, is that uh, we will need to be um, more aggressive really be thinking boldly about just that issue. How do we protect the city in the future? And there is a blueprint to do that, and we're starting to implement those projects. But it is, as I said earlier, I think a new, um, a new lens that we need to be thinking about when we think about the water. I mean, there certainly is a competing, two competing thoughts. One is to sort of adapt, allow development, respond. Uh, the other is to sort of give it back to nature, and that was an issue on, on Staten Island. Um, anyone else would like to respond to, to, to Dick's question on this? Uh, uh, yeah. It, it, so, 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 yeah. I thought of Keynes and Long and the Arrow did. 
but uh, you know, it's a, there, we're not going to move the city of New York in, in, in our lifetime. And uh, um, I, I, the answer is is not so much the plan. I think there's the, the Bloomberg plan uh, is uh, and as adopted by Mayor De Blasio is a good one. Um, the the real question is funding, um, and the real question is political. Um, you know, what what uh, can we do? Uh, it, it is organized as a, as a waterfront community and as, as New Yorkers. It's amazing how quick $50 billion can get spent. It was a, that's just a down payment on what the post-Sandy uh, uh, money that came in to uh, help uh, rebuild and uh, 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 make more resilient the, the city. Um, uh, there, there's a huge price tag to be paid uh, and must be paid as other countries have done around the world. We, we haven't, I don't think we've really come to terms with how to pay for that and, and, and how quickly we need to move. So I think there is there's a, a dissipating sense of urgency and a political that we have to uh, recognize. And, and I would add, you will often see uh, studies that, that say, well, these cities will be most affected by sea level rise and climate change. A study came out last year that, that analyzed that based on the value per square foot of the particular city. And then once you realize how that would impact New York City, it, it really shows how much in capital investment needs to happen in order for us to sort of change our way of thinking. Uh, in the back, yes, sir. Yes, <clears throat> my name is Michael Levine. I am a planning consultant to Manhattan Community Board One, and I'd like to address one of the issues that came up earlier in the discussion about community involvement in planning what happens on the waterfront. The discussion kind of moved from not so much who owns the waterfront, but how is the waterfront used? And when the discussion arose about how do we make sure that all the communities are involved, I heard one of the panelists say, well, certain disadvantaged communities might not be able to participate in the planning process as well as others and could suffer if you involve what I thought I heard was too much community planning. I'd like to talk about one experience sponsored by Economic Development Corporation in New City in which a special working group has been formed with a consultant facilitator paid for by EDC to work with the Seaport community downtown, the borough president, the city council member, the community board chairperson, and 17 stakeholders in the community are sitting on a working group with Howard Hughes Corporation, a developer, trying to determine the principles by which the Seaport area should be rebuilt. I think that's an excellent model, the idea of the city providing resources to all communities, not just Law Manhattan, which is a wealthy community, and a community experience in getting what it wants for the city of New York. But I'd like to know if you think this model could be followed in other parts of the city, in disadvantaged communities that do not yet have an identified plan for their community. Could we do the same thing and replicate the seaport work we do elsewhere in the city to guarantee maximum community participation in planning for the future uses of the waterfront? I open the question to the full panel. We'd like to feel that. Okay. Hi, I'm Bridget Chewy, and I am. Um, can, can, can we get the somebody okay. answer? I, I will get to the question. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. The Seaport Working Community hasn't done anything, so why would we want them to do any more? We have no results. We don't know what the results are going to be. So I think that's a moot point. Why don't we wait to see what they do, and then we can decide? So, so I think I think I think the way I would so let me let me let me let me sort of so there's there's clearly a model here for community input. Does the model work? Does it not work? Or do we not know whether the model works yet? For those of you who are familiar with the situation, Dan. Yeah, I mean, I guess I would ask a question back, which is, what was the process by which this uh, this this model was set up? In other words. How was EDC engaged? How much work did it take to get to the point, whether it's going to be fruitful or not, to get to the point where you are now and, and where you think it's a positive model that could actually be useful? And you know, what kind of resources, what kind of brain power, what you know, did it take to get to where you are? And was it driven by EDC or was it driven by community members? It was driven by the community that said we have a developer who wants to come in, and we can talk about this now, and build a 40-story tower on the waterfront adjacent to Pier 17. We can't allow that to happen until we have a process whereby we all talk about what is the best use of the seaport waterfront. 
EDC at that point said, okay, we'll slow down. We held some public meetings downtown. Robert was at that public meeting and brought many, many speakers and asked that the process be slowed down. And EDC responded by saying, we will convene a series of meetings and we will hire a facilitator to assist in the planning process. It has gone on, yes, admittedly, for three months, and we hope to have a conclusion at the end of May. I think it was a fruitful process. I think it was minimal effort on the part of EDC to organize the meetings, to work with the elected officials to determine appropriate stakeholders, and to engage the services of a facilitator to make it work. This is the model, and again, I'm not talking about the outcome. I'm saying I think that model could be replicated elsewhere in the city. So Robert or Tom, do either of you have a brief follow-up to that? Uh, very brief. Um, thank you for the, the positive feedback on that process. Um, I, I think you're right. It, it's still um, in process. It's, it's, it, it, I don't think you're speaking to outcome. You're thinking, speaking to engagement. Um, on that particular instance, uh, in, in terms of the level of engagement, the, the feedback of the working group is not the end of the process. It is really part of a longer process, um, including a formal process by which that, sp that particular development will be vetted reviewed at the community board, um, reviewed at other levels, and ultimately voted on by the, by the city council. To, to your question, and the broader question of can you can you apply that model to other places, I would say yes. Um, I think that what we've sought to do in our planning, and, and I think other agencies would agree, that um, you know, although we, ha we haven't sort of tried to take a um, one-size-fits-all approach to the, the kind of outreach and planning that we do in a community. Um, there are certain communities in certain instances where that may be an effective model. And, um, you know, and in, in our toolkit, when we're laying out planning processes and engagement processes, that sort of model is one of the ones that we're thinking about. Robert? I think the idea of the working group and having that community process is a good one and it should be replicated elsewhere. I think though the, the model to look at more is one that happened recently in a community that was not a waterfront community, but in Seward Park, where community w was brought in, all the stakeholders were brought in to lay out certain guidelines that were then used before uh, an RFP was issued to, to solicit development. In the seaport, in the Middle East, a complicated place, the working group was coming in after a lot of decisions were already made, so it's a, it's a little bit more tenuous as to what influence the working group could really have. But again, the, the idea of having community involvement as a guideline to future development, I think, is a good one, and I think it's been proven in, in a place like Silver Park, for sure. Okay. Uh, yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Carly Nassar. I'm an director Courtside New York. And so I wanted to ask um, the panel, maybe some experienced people in the room, for how to tackle um, a certain issue. And I want to talk about a community um, that can only be on the waterfront, and that's the community of float and boats, and not the smaller paddling and rowing ones. And so I happen to be responsible for a historic ship, 172 feet long, the Mary Whalen. And in our multi year search for a home, but particularly since 2012, um, I've learned that there's a notion in New York that boats block the view. And this has actually kept us from getting a home on many piers. Um, and I brought that you know, information to city planning and a bunch of other places, and I was full of ground. We didn't know that, but I then had parties get together and they corroborate the other flies on this pier. Um, and so I don't yet know, it, it doesn't appear to be a zoning concept, and I don't know if it's a legal concept. I don't really know what the concept is. I tend to call it a fuzzy or a secret sleeper concept. But it's valid and there enough to have gotten in our way, but many other boats way too. And so if you start looking around in these piers, there really aren't very many roads um, at all. And so I'd like to know how you people would tackle something like that. So the boats block the view. One use might be historic, historic uh, boats. And, like, what thoughts on this question? Well, it, it, it's. I, I, I'm uh, reticent to uh, name the developer uh, who gave me that exact same line about a, uh, uh, you know, arguing that he was, that they were allowed for boats to ignore the pier, 
quite close here, and it happened to be an article in the paper that very same morning about a 40-story building he was uh, opposing that would have block views. Probably a little bit 50. Thank you. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll leave that there. It's it's ridiculous, and it's it's a, it's actually a, 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 almost a crime uh, that we have. Uh, made our city so inhospitable to historic boats like the Mary Whelan and many, many others. How, how was the last time you saw a tall ship uh, uh, sail past in, in, in New York Harbor? Nineteen seventy-six. Lost in about stopping over. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy. There's. I think we might have turned a little bit of a corner with this Dock NYC project with EDC, where we're opening up six um, locations, uh, trying to make them more user friendly. Um, but uh, I, I think. It's, it's going to be a wharf by wharf, pier by pier. We're working with Domino Sugar Factory to create more uh, the, the wharf there, and make that the, make at least the infrastructure available for and uh, for boats, which simply means clean spallers and gates, so you can park a boat. Um, and so uh, uh, you know uh, the, the struggle that Carolina has gone through it should not be repeated in the next generation. It's it's it's, it's crazy that the, this great harbor does not welcome and support. Historic vessels and all kinds of vessels. Anybody else want to? I'll just say that I, I agree with that, um, and I think boats add to the character of the boats. Of make the the yes, exactly. Yes. Everywhere else in the world, they're on the postcard. So. Right. Exactly. <laughs> uh, the only caveat I would add, and I'd have to admit that I we did sue the city of Poughkeepsie when it leased uh, its its public. Uh, dock on Parkland, uh, the only public access that uh, residents of the city of Poughkeepsie had uh, to the water and to, for using smaller boats, they leased their 60-foot dock to a, or 65-foot dock to a 60-foot uh, tour boat company uh, that wanted to operate a commercial operation there, cutting off all public access <coughs> from that dock. Uh, we wound up resolving that case. Uh, the settlement was they had to get 60 feet of dock space. Uh, so we were very happy to have the tour boat there as long as it didn't take the, the dock away from the public. Well, the reason why I want to mention this in front of legal minds in particular is because when I ran into the concept, it's not calibrated to scale or reduce the boat the way things are ashore. So ashore, you have zoning that's like this is R and this is C, and this is M, several grades of M, maybe it's MX. So that's describing function, and then you have height, so you have scale, whereas like boats block the view. So I happen to have a boat that's actually rather low profile and being public access, you can get the view of the water from the boat plus the boat experience, but that's not a discussion that can be had because the boat's block the view isn't, isn't related to size, scale, or function. And so I thought, that's why I thought this is a really particularly curious concept because it's hidden and absolute and inflexible in the way that regulations are sure don't seem to be. And so I, I'm now happily out in this however way I'm going to get a t-shirt plan. You know, it's like, because I don't think people know enough about it. And it's, and I've run into it and it's there. Thank you for your, and another question. Any, uh, yes, ma'am. Um, my name's Maggie Flanagan. I'm a working merchant mariner for several groups in the harbor, including not-for-profits and small businesses. And uh, I'd like to add one comment and ask a question, add a comment to Mr. Levine's uh, topic about the Seaport Working Group. Uh, the, the South Street Seaport Museum, which is a cultural icon of that district, was not invited to that task force. So there's a flaw in the method that was developed and described there. So as um, that model is used going forward, it would be good to keep an eye out for those kinds of flaws as well. And my question it has to do more with the transportation issue. Um, I've heard a lot about subsidies to ferries, as much as that we all love ferries. And I'm wondering if that's true. Perhaps um, our presenter from EDC knows that. And uh, if there are, is a model for providing subsidies to get ferries started, is that a model that can be used to subsidize human-powered boathouses and historic ships and piers for historic ships? What are the subsidies for those uses? Yeah, well, sure. So uh, all, the, all the ferries that are operated um, within the city, excluding the services between New Jersey and the West Side, are subsidized. Um, they, uh, in order to, like most mass transit, in fact, um, they require a subsidy to, uh, to operate. Uh, in terms of the source of that funds, 
sort of what I was alluding to earlier, and one of the challenges of a sustainable ferry system is a sustainable source of subsidy. Um, so uh, a, ferry system, uh, a ferry service like the Staten Island Ferry does have a sustainable um, subsidy uh, through the federal government. Um, the East River Ferry, as a pilot service, does not have its discretionary funds um, from the city to operate. So it's an excellent public service, it's been a success, but like other forms of mass transit, it does require subsidy. And in order to serve farther reaching places, that subsidy can become quite significant. Uh, so I have to call on one of our Pace Law School students. So Thank you. Justin, go ahead. Um, Justin Woods, I'm a land use and sustainable development scholar at Pace, Pace Law School. And I was also a city planner before law school. Um, Dan raised a really, I think, important issue about the local waterfront revitalization plan. And in New York City, as well as other coastal and waterfront communities across the state, that provides a planning tool for developing local policies for how to use and redevelop waterfronts. And in many cases, that's been how to deal with post-industrial waterfronts that, in the BOA program, how to redevelop them. And I think the, the public trust doctrine, we talked about the the high watermark down, or and it's easy to talk about public land. But when we're talking about regulating private land for public access, I'm curious. I don't know if anybody else up there is a lawyer, but uh, I was curious, you know, whether those regulations meet, you know, the rational nexus rough proportionality tests of Nolan and Dolan, or if that's even out the window now after the Coons decision last the summer. I know those are some of the issues that I wrestled with as a planning director, you know, trying to redevelop waterfronts. That, that you know allowed for private development but maintained you know public values. So if you guys could talk about those, I'd appreciate it. Dan, you want to talk about I mean public access over private development? Yeah, I mean I think uh, again you know you sort of have doctrinal versus pragmatic have doctrinal versus pragmatic answers. Uh, generally, I think those kinds of things are hammered out in a permitting process, right? So a developer wants government approvals. And you know, what, what I hope for is that the government will, will hold a firm line and, and require essentially a concession uh, from the developer that to, to provide for, for public access, whether that's you know, a, a running path that goes along the water, or, you know, a boat launch, whatever it may be. Um, so, but you're right, it's, it is very complicated. It's, it's in flux uh, and uh, it's, it's very difficult to answer. You know, the public trust doctrine um, and coastal zone management is handled differently state by state. Uh, and so, you know, it's difficult to answer it broadly. Uh, but I think in most cases, uh, developers seeking government approvals can be coaxed into government stands a hard enough line can be coaxed into doing the right thing. But, but I think you raise an interesting question. To what extent should the public have access over private property to access another public act, you know, to a public space like, like water? And in some jurisdictions, the public uh, you know, automatically gets an easement to, to go across that private land, or you'll have a you know, foreign doctrine like Almondsrotten in Sweden, where it's legal to camp on somebody's front yard. Uh, it's recreational use, uh, and they can't stop you, right? And so, you know, depending on what, what our notions of what public use means, right, that, that can change in, in the U.S. It changes state by state. And, and it's different depending on whether you're talking about tidal waters or inland waters. Um, you know, you're allowed in New York State to portage across a uh, dry piece of land where you're, you're uh, canoeing or kayaking up a stream and you reach a point that's impassable. But my, my point was just that with the, after Coons, it's a lot harder for the government to demand those exactions uh, because they may they may try to do it give give a grant approval and then get sued and then the approval stands without the exaction. In the white shirt the back. Yeah, hi, uh, my name is Sarah Williams. Um, just a quick question going back to the ferry service. Um, I've just noticed years ago I used to live in Williamsburg a couple blocks from the waterfront and then it eventually got very expensive once they changed the zoning on the waterfront and built the giant towers and they're still building more towers. And I'm assuming that's probably why the ferry service on that side is increased a lot or in use at all. Why not maybe think about subsidizing the ferries with the developers who are taking advantage of 
the, the change in the zoning and now being able to build the towers, whether it's built into like, say, um, common charges from the buildings, or I don't know, I mean, it just seems like just a thought out there. So I don't know if that's even like something that can be discussed, but I was yes, a little curious. Yes, it can be discussed. <laughs> <laughs> we can call it a very poop district and uh, five uh, dollars to, seriously, and, and not yeah, just, well, not just for you folks that live in Williamsburg, or used to live in Williamsburg, but for people who live in the Rockaways or Soundview. Yeah. I don't pay more to get to downtown Manhattan from my home in Flatbush than someone who lives in, in Brooklyn Heights to get down here. And you know there's some marginal difference between that very rough my, my subway ride and one uh, that's closer in. You don't do that. And I think we, you know, um, I, I feel EDC's pain because it comes out of, you know, it's basically uh, competing with library money and UPK money and all, and any, you know, it's coming out of the city budget right now, these, uh, these uh, ferry subsidies. So we have to find a, a steady source of income, and I think your idea is as good as any, but I would extend it further, that it needs to be uh, applied not just to those communities that are close in that have the high rises, but, but also to communities that don't have high rises, and that are a little further out, that need a deep, slightly deeper subsidy to get uh, to and from. Um, people in Soundview have like a two-hour community each, each day, each way, each day, um, uh, and you know, on a good day. And it's, it's just an awful way to, to, to get to, to their jobs. It would be a boon to those communities, and it's a good idea. So we have time for one uh, final uh, brief, brief, brief question. I'm gonna, the, the gentleman in the back. Uh, hi, my name is Sean Dixon with Riverkeeper. Um, I wanted to ask a quick question on, like a, a slight take on the question of today, which is, who owns the waterfront's history? Um, we look at a lot of things like pollution, we look at a lot of toxics and like, you know, domino sugar, whether you're repairing a public access point on the Harlem River that's just covered in garbage because it's a landfill, or you're looking at something like the East River Ferries where you need to take into consideration habitat protection. So there's a lot of things that you need to do with CSOs and stormwater. Uh, upon which to build all these future great ideas that you need to start working on now. Almost there, the infrastructure at the bottom to either bring things up to pollution code or to, uh, uh, you know, make sure that we're not um, building on top of problematic infrastructure that needs to be torn up later. And so who owns that legacy problem if we're going to start doing all of this great um, planning and, and future development? Who'd like to feel that one? <laughs> <laughs> and, I mean, I guess the, the answer is, is uh, the public. It's oftentimes the city. Um, I think it goes back to a comment I made earlier about the, the added complexity and cost of the waterfront. That the infrastructure, uh, bulkheads, um, bringing all those services and bringing that infrastructure to a state of good, modern, resilient state of good repair um, is one of the challenges for the public sector to um, keep its waterfront. And, and what I started with before, that's our that that's got to be recognized as a, a legitimate cost of, of uh, having a great waterfront city. Um, it, it's easier with, with a couple of super fun sites, you know, how that works than anybody here talking. But uh, uh, with for everything else, we have to just say we want great ferry service, we want the recreation, we want access. We got to pay for it, and it's, it's part of the like schools or anything else. We have to, we have to tax ourselves so we have a great waterfront city. Thank you. Well, let me um, let me conclude by by thanking you know Pace University for providing this forum. Uh, thank you all for coming, and finally, thank you to our our, our panelists. I hope you all have a lovely evening. Thank you.